How many of you know prayer changes things? I want to share that with you, and that dovetails into what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about what happens when we pray. What happens when we pray? You know, starting on tomorrow, we're asking each one of the members of Elizabeth Baptist Church to commit themselves to joining us in prayer. 31 days of prayer. And that's critically important because here's what I've discovered. I think in, in this day and age in which we're living in and with technology and social media and 24-hour cable TV and all the different type things that we have going on, I think that as a body of believers, we've gotten away from understanding and appreciating the tool that God is giving us to interface with him and to affect change in the earth realm. And that's the power of prayer. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to share some things with you today. I want, to, I want to dig a little deep on prayer because many of y'all are sitting there thinking, well, you know, my prayer life is not very effective. I don't see answered prayers. Um, some of you sitting there saying, I don't really know how to pray, Pastor. Uh, and so, but, but prayerfully, as we go through this, this, um, this teaching, that it will, it will embolden you to understand that God has gifted you, yes, you, with the ability to, to bombard the throne room of grace. He's given each one of us the capacity to effect change in the earth realm. There's a scripture that says, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous does what? avails much. And so when righteous men and women of God pray, we should see change taking place in the earth around. Amen? Uh, I, I remember when the old saints used to sing the song, I know prayer changes things, right? How many of y'all remember that? And when I was out, out on the stormy, stormy raging sea, I was hungry, I was sick, and I was... I, I got some, some of y'all looking at me like you don't know what in the world I'm talking about. But along came Jesus and he... And I know prayer changes things. Amen. And that is my testimony. I am a living witness that prayer does change things. So if you have your Bibles, guys, I want you to turn with me to Philippians, the fourth chapter. And we're going to delve into this. Uh, certainly, I am I'm wise enough at this point in my ministry to know that I do not have time to finish all of this. So we, we're going to take our time because it's crucially important. I believe if we as Christians understood the power that has been entrusted to us, we, we would, we, our prayer lives would be much more fervent and much more alive. You know, uh, the Barna Group does a lot of uh, uh, surveys on, on Christian trends, and one of the things that they discovered when they surveyed is that people don't regularly pray. I said people, Christians, don't regularly pray. Everybody say regularly. Now, y'all know what regular means, right? That means on a consistent uh, basis, right? How many of y'all go to the bathroom regularly? I just, just need to know, amen? <laughs> if you don't go to the bathroom regularly, you know, something in your body will begin to break down. Can I get two witnesses up in here? Everybody in here that's a human being has to go regularly. Now, I'm, here's what I'm going to tell you. I think that as a Christian, uh, the same thing happens to us, where there is something that breaks down in our spiritual growth when we don't regularly go to the Lord in prayer. And when we don't pray the right way and for the right reasons, okay? So let's look at this, this text here, and let's see if we can learn some things about what God wants us to know so that we can grow and develop and be the person that God called and ordained for us to be. Amen? And before I get in, I understand we have the family of uh, our longtime usher. She's gone to be the Lord several years now. Sister Lester B. Wright's family is sharing with us today. So let's give them a hand. Amen. As they come together. Y'all, I've been pastoring here, what, 30 years? And some of you, some of you have been here 
uh, 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 most of that time with me remember Sister Wright, um, who's the usher on the door over there. So we thank God for her her family sharing with us today, okay? So Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number four. The Apostle Paul is writing this passage of Scripture, okay? And Paul is writing here, and I, I want us to, uh, to, to, to focus in on it. We'll uh, read this from the New Living Translation. It says, Paul says in verse 4, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, what? Rejoice. All right? Watch this. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Verse number 5, let's read. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. And then again, he says, now don't worry about anything. Instead, what? Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Watch that again. It says, tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Next verse, let's read it. Then you will experience what? God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Verse 8 for good measure. Let's watch. Let's read it. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and pure and, and, and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are what? Excellent and worthy of praise. Amen. And worthy of praise. Now, again, as we get into the meat of this text here, the Apostle Paul writes here, and, and again, as he customarily does in his writing, if you read Paul's letters, Paul would, in the first part of his letters, deal with what we should believe. In other words, Paul would come down and teach you doctrine, fundamental teachings of the faith, what you should believe. How many of y'all know it's critically important in these days of false doctrine that we know Bible doctrine? And so Paul, in his writing, the first part of his letters, he would, he would tell you what to believe, and then in the second half of his letter, he would go into practical application. How do you apply this stuff in your everyday life? Because I can, listen, I can know Bible doctrine, but if I can't apply it to my everyday life, what good does it do? And so here, in this, where our text is coming from, he's dealing with some practical stuff that they needed to, to get going with in this church in Philippi, amen? As a matter of fact, if you will, go back with me to the first part of this chapter, verse number one, because Paul is talking about this church here. And he's, now, notice what he says here. We're talking about practicality. Those things that he's taught you should be showing up in your life. There's, it, it makes no sense for us to be involved in a ministry, and what we learn in our ministry does not affect how we live, amen, every day of the week. If we're coming to church to make ourselves feel good, but what we learn and the doctrinal truths that are imparted to us are not showing up in how we live, then there's a problem. Amen? There is a problem, especially when it comes to prayer. Look at what Paul says here. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. Now, he's talking to born-again believers. He says, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I received for my work. Can you tell that Paul had a fondness for these saints at Philippi? Would, would you agree? Watch what it says here. He says, I love you and long to see you, dear friends. Right? Now, how many of y'all have some people who you're, you, who you're in connectivity with in the church, but you, you wouldn't exactly say, I love you and long to see you? Is anybody in fellowship with people who you don't really long to see? Come on, let's be honest. Paul was not like that with the church. Paul says, I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Verse 2, come on, let's read. It says what? Now, I, watch this. Here's what was going on. There was some dysfunctionality in the church. There were some church leaders who were not getting along, two women in particular. And how many of y'all know? <sighs> okay, I don't even need to say that. You mean, y'all are already on that, aren't you? See, the Holy Ghost just said... He says, now I appeal to Yodia and Sentite, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. 
See, when, when, you know, when men have disagreement, we sort of handle a little bit different than you ladies. Am I right about it? Some, some, some of us do, right? right? Men sometimes won't even deal with it, okay? But, but, but you ladies, you, you guys will get in discord with one another, and, and you'll pretend like you're in fellowship, but you're really not in fellowship. Come on now. There's something that you need to talk about, but you won't talk about it, but then you pretend like everything is okay. And so here Paul says this, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. It's, it's crucially important that ministry leaders, amen, be in, in, in connection and be on one accord. Look at verse 3. Let's read it. It says what? And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. These ladies were instrumental in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, amen? His death, burial, and resurrection as the mechanism for people to get into right standing with God. He says, they worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. So we, we got, listen, they had a disagreement. Paul said, let's deal with it and get it right. Verse number five, let's go back again. It says what? Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Now again, when we look at this, the, the part that we, I really want to get to, talking about prayer, uh, we says what happens when we pray? And we want to talk about it. One of the things, that I want you to just write this down. I did not give you all any notes today. So you got to use the back of your, your handout uh, that you were given, and it says sermon notes. Okay? Because if I'm, if I'm a bad man, some of those sermon notes that I wrote out for you uh, previously, a lot of y'all went, took it home, and, and, and maybe it made it home, but some of y'all is still in your car. Uh, maybe it's, it's in the slit of your Bible. Maybe it's in the trash can at home, and you didn't go back and review it, did you? Uh, come on, you going to be honest with me? Okay, I don't expect you to. All right. All right. But, but today, by the way, again, I, I got going, and I didn't get a chance to get them out. That's why I didn't get it to you, okay? But, but you're going to write today. Can you write with me? All right, can you write with me? Are you with me? All right, so, so watch this, watch this. So first thing I want you to write down is this. That when we pray, peace comes. Everybody say peace. Peace comes. Let's get back to the text. When we pray, peace comes. Peace comes through prayer. Y'all know that, right? But uh, but as we look at this, there, there are three things I want. Uh, three points I want you. I want you to just notice here. And and first of all, when we look at this text, first thing there's there's a charge. Okay, everybody say a charge. All right? A charge means there's, there's a command. There is a directive. Get back with me to verse number six. Pop verse six up right quick. So we know when we pray, amen, what happens when we pray? Peace comes through prayer. He says, says don't worry about anything. Instead, what? Pray about everything. Now, again, the English language, when you read this, it says you don't worry. There's an understood you there. The writer doesn't have to put you in there because in the English language, there's an understood you. Don't worry about anything. So that is a direct command from God for us not to worry. Okay. So if God says don't worry, why is it that many Christians find themselves worrying? And if I find myself worrying, am I not in direct disobedience to this command here that says don't worry about anything? Okay? I, I need y'all to talk to me. If I'm worrying, am I in disobedience to the Scripture? Absolutely. It says do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about what? About everything. So the charge here is, first of all, it says, don't be anxious, uh, 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 over, over worried about anything, nothing. Everybody say nothing. Now, humanly speaking, here's what was happening. The Philippians, from a human standpoint, had every reason to worry and be anxious. But why do you say that, Brother Pastor? Well, first of all, number one, they were suffering some severe persecution. Go with me, if you will. Philippians, the first chapter, go back to verse number 18 and 19 right quick. They were, they were suffering uh, some severe persecution. And when you're suffering through something, there is a greater tendency to worry, right? Look at what the text says. But that doesn't matter. 
whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. All right? Now watch this. He says, "What? So, re so I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. Verse 19. For I know that as you pray for me, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ help me, this will do what? Lead to my deliverance. Verse number 20. Let's read. It says, what? For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring what? Honor to Christ, whether I live or whether not, whether I die. All right? So, so Paul here in, in, this, in this text is saying, listen, guys, no matter what you're going through, and I'm going through suffering, because at the time that he was writing this, we know, you Bible studies know, that he was incarcerated. Paul was in jail as he writes this letter. But even though he's in jail, he's writing to encourage the saints at Philippi. Can I get a witness? And so to me, that tells me that Paul, Paul, Paul did not allow his circumstance or his situation, Lou, to affect his joy. Paul didn't let what was going on around him dictate and determine what was going on on the inside of him. He didn't allow his situation, which, uh, again, he could have been facing impending death here because he was in prison, but he didn't allow that to take away his joy. So can you honestly say, as we sit here, that when you are facing persecution, you still got joy? See, they, they were suffering some severe persecution. They were also facing a disturbance in the church, some disunity and some arguing that was going on. We just saw that earlier with Eodas and Syntyche, right? So they, they had disunity going on in the church. That would have been a reason to be worried because out of every place you go, it would seem like you could come to church and be at peace. Would y'all agree? Oh, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? But you all that know and read your Bible understand and know that everybody that's in church is not growing in their faith. Everybody that's in church is not, it's not purpose, amen, don't have the same purpose and goal in mind. And so as a result, we have uh, 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 varying degrees of opinions and, and thoughts and people are coming for various reasons. And so you're going to have some turmoil in a, in a place that has infallible people in it, right? Because all of us, Messed up from time to time. Remember right about it? Let me see the hand of every Christian here that has messed up since you've been born again. All right? Had, had thoughts that were not uh, in line with God's will for your life, right? All right? So we all can get off course, but what I've always shared with you guys is this. We should not have a lifestyle of being off course. Can I get a witness today? So they were facing some disturbance in the church, some disunity and quarreling. That could cause you to worry. They had some, some carnal members within that church, some members who were prideful, who were super spiritual, and who were self-centered. Go to Philippians, the second chapter with me right quick. And let's begin our reading at verse nothing. Verse, verse nothing. Verse number one. Start at verse number one. Philippians 2, verse number one. What happens when we pray? Peace comes when we pray. Why Paul is saying peace comes when we pray, when we pray the right way, for the right reason, and our heart's in the right place, okay? Just praying any old kind of way is not what he's talking about here. Look at what the text says here. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Verse 3, verse 2, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with what? One mind and purpose. There it is right now. In the church, the reason why we have so many problems is because everybody is not working for the same purpose. Everybody don't have the same mind. Paul said in one other place, he says, let this mind be in you that's what? Also in Christ Jesus. So if we don't have the, if we have the mind of Christ, if both of us have the mind of Christ, why can't we get along? If both of us are, are have the same purpose and the same goal, we should be able to effectively minister and share in the church. So they had some, they had some carnal members here. And look at verse 3 and 4 with me right quick. The text says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. This is the mentality that Paul says we should have in the church. 
And he's encouraging the Philippian church to get back to the same mentality, to have that mind of Christ. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others also. Can I get a witness? So, so because of the carnality of some of the, those in the membership, uh, there was a cause for, for worry uh, in the natural. And, and, and they were facing some false teachers who had joined the fellowship, and the teachers were, 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 were attacking, amen, the message of the cross. So all these things in the natural realm would cause these people in this church to have a tendency to worry. But Paul says, as we go back to flipping the fourth chapter, don't worry about anything. So if I'm worrying, that means I'm out of the will of God. Now, now guys, watch this. Uh, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Now, as we go into this month of prayer, I want us to understand something. Jesus gave us this privilege to pray. As a matter of fact, Jesus placed himself at the service of our words. I'm going to repeat that. Jesus placed himself at the service of our words, the words that come out of our mouth. Go to Hebrews, the third, third chapter, let me right quick. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 1. What happens when we pray? Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 1. Are y'all there? Let's read. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called heaven, think carefully about this Jesus whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. Let's go to the King James version of that passage. I want to read it from the KJV because this, this is real important here. Uh, Hebrews, the third chapter, verse number one. Let's read. Can y'all read me out loud on purpose? It's what? Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Consider what? The apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now, this chapter here in Hebrews actually compares Jesus and Moses. You that study your Bibles know that Moses was faithful as, 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 a, as, a, as a mediator or a go-between between God and the nation of Israel. Is that right? But at times, Moses cried out to God and, and said that the people were wearying him. The people were, 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 were causing him to ever hate that he was chosen to be their leader, right? How many of y'all out there uh, work with people or even manage people on your place of employment? You have to, you have to manage people. How many of y'all in ministry have to work with people who, who you're, you've, you've been commissioned to lead or to guide them? Anybody in ministry, all right? How many of you know when you work with people, it can be a challenge, it can be a challenge to try to get people who should know better to actually do better. Let me go look close at home. How many of y'all are married to somebody who should know better but are not doing better? I got one amen over here. <laughs> Let me walk the aisle. How, how many y'all have had? How many y'all have had some situations? I got one right here. Okay, can I get one over here? Can I get one over here? Here, here, here. Listen, we all are in relationships with people, and people are fallible, and as a result of that, 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 that our non-perfectness, we have issues. And there are times when people who we deal with who should know better, but they don't do it any better. And so if you've been in a part of a church ministry and, and, and you have to deal with baby Christians, uh, it, it, can, it can actually drain you a little bit. Am I right about it? So Moses, as the ordained leader of the nation of Israel, was the go-between between God and the people and the nation. He was a mouthpiece, amen, for God to, out to the nation, and he was an interceder, amen, for the people to God, right? So, so but Jesus, just like Moses, amen, is our go-between, all right? Now, notice what Hebrews 3 and 1 says. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our what? Profession. Profession, confession, similar word, same meaning, okay? If I profess something, that means I do what? 
I have to say it. All right? So look at what the text says. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession. Who's our? Us, born-again believers, right? Now look, the apostle. Apostle, if you know anything about what apostle means, it is one who is sent or one who is sent forth. The, 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 Jesus Christ being the apostle, he's, he's sent forth, amen, to go to the throne room of God for you and I. The text says, consider the apostle and the high priest of our what? Profession. So I, I, I start this off by saying Jesus placed himself at the service of our words. If he is the apostle and the high priest of our profession, that means that we have an op op opportunity to, to send Jesus, our apostle, to go to the Father on our behalf. Okay, what, what are you getting at, Brother Pastor? Well, again, we don't realize that in our prayer life, we have the ability to move the hand of our mediator, Jesus Christ. The Bible says he sits on the right hand of the Father making intercessions for us. Is that correct? And so, so if he is the apostle who is one sent and the high priest of our profession, then that means that he's waiting on us to tell him what to do. What do you mean by that, my pastor? Well, the Bible, then the Bible says, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and what? And the door shall be open. Well, why is it that we go around saying, well, you know, the Lord knows what I need. The Lord knows what I need. I don't have to ask him. Where did you get that from? Where did you get that from? Because the text is already told. It says, ask, seek, and not. So if I, don't, if I don't say something with my mouth, then my high priest or the apostle of my what? Profession, which is what? The words that I speak, he can't take that to the Father to get the answer because I never didn't say anything. I was spiritual. Well, you know, you know, I, you know, God knows what I need, and, and I just wait on him to give what I need. Well, no, he said ask. Is that right? So he's the high priest of our profession. And then uh, he's, the, he's the apostle, the sent one. The high priest is the one who represents us before the Father. So we got to learn that part of our prayer is, part of praying is, is saying words that line up with what Jesus said in his word. Go to John 1 and 1 with me right quick. Come on, John 1 and 1. Hurry, hurry. What happens when we pray? First of all, we have peace. Now, we, got, we, we, we have the charge in there. It says, be anxious or don't be worried about anything, right? John 1 and 1. When you're in the midst of a situation, what do you do? How do you keep yourself from worrying? Well, prayer should bring peace if we understand how to pray effectively. Watch what the text says. Verse number one says, what? Well, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word, what? Was God. The next verse says what? Let's read. The same was in the beginning with God. Watch this, verse three. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Come on, let's read next verse. In him was life. And the life was the light of what? Of men. Next verse, let's read. It says, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness come here to not. Now, take, stop for a second. This is talking about Jesus Christ himself. This is telling us that Jesus was in the beginning, right? And it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. It goes on to say, and I keep reading, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among men. And whoever believes on that word can have, what, eternal life. So now the word is Jesus himself, and the word of God is, is God's revelation to us. Now when I begin to pray, if I'm going to receive that peace that we talked about over in the Philippians, if I'm going to re receive answers to my prayers, one of the things i got to start doing is pray according to the word. Now, if I'm not praying according to the word, then, then my high priest, 
the, the profession of, of uh, the apostle of my profession can't take what I said and take it to the father because he's not going to go to the father with something that doesn't line up with the father's word. Are y'all tracking with me? So what are you trying to say, pastor? Well, I believe sometimes one of the reasons why we don't get answers to our prayers is because we're not praying right. Are y'all listening to me today? Get back with me. Go back to Philippians right quick. So in order for me to pray right, I got to make sure that I get in line with God's word. If I expect an answer, I got to, I got to make sure that I'm praying in line with God's word. So I said in Philippians here, we got a charge. That means don't be, don't be worried about anything, okay? Don't be over anxious about anything. Now, the next thing I want you to keep in mind is, is that number two, uh, the, 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 the remedy for any worry is prayer because prayer is going to bring peace, right? So the second thing you need to write down, the remedy for any worry is prayer. The four, the four words used for prayer show exactly how prayer is the answer for anxiety and worry. How many of y'all know that medical physicians tell us that there are a lot of diseases that are directly connected to our worry and anxiety? Worry can actually change your physical body. But I'm here to tell you, if God says, I, don't, I shouldn't worry, then I don't have to worry. And if I'm worrying, that means I am out of alignment with God's will in my, for my life. Is everybody still with me today? All right, so watch. watch. So, so number two, write, write that down. The remedy for worry is prayer, okay? So, so, so the first thing is, we look at what he says in Philippians. Go back to Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 6. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and do what? Thank him for all that he has done. The KJV, let's go to the KJV, and I like the way it reads. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer. First of all, prayer. Prayer refers to the, the special times of prayer that we share, amen, in our devotional time, in our worship time. One of the things that I, I want to encourage each one of you all to do is to get you a quiet time that you get before the Lord on a regular basis, right? A quiet time where you spend time in prayer, where you spend time uh, studying God's word. We need to have it. So prayer, prayer, prayer here deals with our devotional time going to God. Notice this next word says, by prayer and supplication. That word supplication Amen. It, it, it's, 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 it's an intense word because it talks about when you go before a king, amen, to supplicate it means to pour out, to pour out your soul to God, amen. It means, it means to, to cry out, to plead before God through prayer and supplication with, number three, thanksgiving. In other words, that means you got to thank God and praise him for what he is going to do in your life. you got to thank him for what you are believing him for, even before the answer comes. Go to Mark the 11th chapter with me right quick. Come on. What happens when we pray? We get peace. Peace comes. Peace comes. Mark the 11th chapter. Watch this. Because, guys, I'm going to tell you something. One of the things that we got to recognize is that uh, if, I, if we don't see any movement in the things that we're praying about, it's not that God is deaf and can't hear us. It's because many times we're not praying in line with his word and we're not praying in faith. Mark 11, chapter, verse number 23 with him right quick. Let's go there right quick. So as we commune to pray this month, I want you to think about your individual prayer life. Am I receiving from God the things that God wants me to receive? Am I putting myself in a position to where my apostle and high priest of my profession can take what I say and go to the Father with it. Now, he's not going to take something that doesn't line up with his word. Right? Y'all do know that, right? Because if he took something that didn't line up with his word, that means that he would, he would be in opposition to the very word that, that he, 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 he honors above everything, even above his name. He said, heaven and earth may pass away, but my word is going to do it. It's going to stand. All right, so, so Mark 11, y'all there with me? Let's read together out loud on all purposes. What? I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must 
really believe it will happen, have no doubt where? In your heart. Now watch this. This is the attitude of us when we pray. He says this, I can say to the mountain, KJV says, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And if I don't doubt in my heart, but I believe the thing that I say going to come to pass, I can have what I say, right? I can have what I'm praying about. But, but he says, but you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt where in your heart. Verse number 24, let's read together. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be what? Yours. All right? Now watch this. Pause this just for a second. Now we know, come on, I got to clarify that, because we know that if I pray for anything, that anything has to be in line with God's word. You can't pray for evil stuff. Now listen, uh, sometimes we're praying for things that really, uh, that God says we don't really need or that it's not good for us. Sometimes we're praying for things that are not in line with God's word. I, you're not going to know that unless you get into God's word. Let's read again. It says, I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. Verse number 25. Let's read. It says what? But when you're praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against. Now watch this. Maybe your prayers are not being answered because you hadn't dealt with unforgiveness that's in your heart. You know, a lot of times we are harboring unforgiveness with family members. We're harboring unforgiveness with church members. We're even harboring unforgiveness with our spouses, with coworkers. And as a born-again believer, if I have unforgiveness in my heart, it blocks my access to the throne room of God. Look at what he says. But when you are praying, the first thing you got to do is what? Forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will do what? Forgive your sins too. Verse 26, let's read. This is what? Uh, 26. Okay, here we go. Here we go. We're moving. We're moving. All right. All right. I'm going to read out the book. Amen. See, when technology fails you, that's why you always bring your Bible. Can I get a witness? Mark 11, praise the Lord. Verse number 26, out loud on purpose says, but if you, do, <laughs> if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. 27 and 28, let's read. And they, and they came come again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking the temple, there come him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Verse 28 says what? Uh, and say unto him, by what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? To do this thing. Now, Jesus really tripped these religious leaders up. They couldn't understand because he wasn't doing things the way they'd done things. And so, as a result, they wanted to know by what authority was he speaking. Look at the next verse. Come on, let's go. It says, And Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask of you one question and answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 30, come on, let's read. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. Now watch this, verse 31, look at, look at the text. And they reason with themselves, saying, if we say, if we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of men, they feared the people, for all the men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. Now what Jesus did, does right here, he asked them a question that he knew their heart wasn't right, and they were coming after him because he was having kingdom impact in leading others into a relationship with him. So the religious folks got mad. In other words, it's sort of like some churches, they get mad when this church grows and their church is not growing. So what they do, they start talking about this church is growing rather than addressing the reason why their church is not growing. Are you following me? And so Jesus would not allow them to trap him because he, he has all knowledge and all power. Let's get back to Philippians right quick. And I, and I want to uh, close down on this part right here. Now watch this. We're supposed to walk in God, right? We're supposed to live, move, and have our being in him, and we do this through the avenue of prayer. Amen? We pray in times that, that we specifically set, ourselves, set, set aside some quiet time and to get before the Lord, but we got to make sure, guys, that we are doing it the right way. All right? Now, Philippians, the, uh, back to the fourth chapter, and look, look back with me at verse number six right quick. Everybody say, what happens when we pray? Prayer should bring peace to our life. 
But it does not happen, guys, if we are not, amen, praying the right way. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Now, as, as Peter, I mean, as Paul prays this and, and he writes this text here, guys, we got to realize that when we do worry, that's a sign of, of unbelief. That's a sign that we don't believe that God's word is actually true. All right? So, so I got to ask myself this question. How do I get to a point to where I'm praying and believing the things that I'm praying and asking God for. Because if, we, if we're going to go through 31 days of prayer, but we're just coming up here because we're just meeting and we don't really believe that the things that we're saying will come to pass and that we're going to have what we say, then why even come? All right? And even in your own life, guys, you got to ask the question, do I really believe the things that I'm praying about? Am I really on point with God? Am I really in a position where I'm thanking God and I'm believing him for the things that, that, that I'm asking him for? Now, the way we get to that point is, first of all, number one, to get to the point where we, where we believe God, first of all, we've got to make sure that we're lined up with God's word. Okay? And I can't know that if I'm not in God's word. Are y'all with me today? I cannot know that if I'm not in God's word. So I'm going to ask you a question. And don't raise your hands here. But how many days of the week do you find yourself opening the Bible and actually praying and asking the Holy Spirit to show you yourself through the Word? How many days of the week do you spend meditating on the things of God? Because you can't grow without the Word. Go to 1 Peter 2 and 2. Favorite passage of Scripture of mine, okay? Favorite passage of Scripture of mine. And I want you all to see this because, guys, here's what I discovered. In this church, in the church, we're not experiencing the personal spiritual growth and we're not seeing our prayers being answered because many of us have failed to allow the word to take up a, 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 a residence in our hearts. Look at what Peter says here. Read with me out loud and on purpose. It says, what? Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. Now, how many ladies have, y'all know, y'all used that before, but how many of you ladies have had children? How many, how many mothers do we have in the house? Okay. Every mother knows that in order for a baby to grow, they must have what? Milk. All right. They come from the hospital craving milk. The more milk they digest and put in their body, the, 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 the more they grow and the stronger they become. Paul, uh, Peter actually compares your spiritual growth to the natural milk that a baby receives. So, guys, uh, if we look at our prayer lives and we don't have any word time, then we're not going to be growing in our spiritual walk so that we can understand the things of God and learn how to pray. He says, like a newborn baby, crave that spiritual milk so that you can grow into a full experience, okay? Cry out for this nourishment. Now, when's the last time you cried out for the word of God? When's the last time you went to church and said, Pastor, teach me some more? Some of y'all saying, Pastor, you've taught me enough today. It's time to go home. <laughs> See, prayer is one of those subjects that I'm not giving you five steps uh, to get $500,000. Prayer is one of those subjects that each one of us has to commit to First of all, doing, but not only commit to doing, but commit to doing it God's way. And it starts with a diet of the word of God. Uh, he says here, cry out for this nourishment. Go to verse 3 with him right quick. Let's look at it. it says, now that you have had a taste of the Lord's what? Of the Lord's kindness. How many of y'all have tasted the Lord and know that he's good? How many of y'all have, have experienced, amen, the saving and the perfecting work of God in your life? How many of y'all have experienced, amen, God doing things and answering prayers and opening doors for you? When, you? when you taste that, guys, it ought to cause you to have a greater appetite for it, right? See, if I've never tasted, amen, good quality food, I don't know what I'm missing. Am I right about it? But when I taste good quality food and when, I, when, I, when, I, when I've digested that, it causes me, I don't know about anybody else, but it causes me to desire it even more. 
And what, what Peter is saying here in the text is, is that, that when we tasted and saw that the Lord is good, it should cause us to desire him even more, okay? So, uh, but when it comes to our prayer life, we got to first of all realize that in order for us to pray right, we got to have the word guiding our prayers. Everybody say, let the word guide my prayers. All right? So, so, so if you get back to Philippians right quick, the, the, the third thing I want you to just make a point of, I said, first of all, the, ch the charge was given not to worry, right? The, the second thing is the remedy, amen, for, for anxiety worry is prayer. Am I right about it? And then thirdly, amen, uh, the, the, the promise that we have when we pray is that we got peace, the peace that passes all understanding that comes from our time in prayer. We are to we are to pray about everything, no matter how small and how insignificant it may seem. God is interested in every little detail of your life. I mean, God wants to know about your children. He wants to know about your finances. He wants to know about your marriage. He wants to know about uh, your, your concerns. He says, cast all of your care upon me, for I care it for you. Amen? So we are to pray about everything. If you will, go with me to the book of uh, uh, Luke... Uh, now, go with me to uh, Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Go to the sixth chapter this, of Ephesians, and let's look at verse number 18 right quick. Ephesians 6 and 18. So what happens when we pray? First of all, peace comes to us when we pray. And we've got to realize that, that, that peace will not be there if we're not praying the right way. And we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to walk down through here, and we're going to take a look at different aspects of prayer as we go through this series, so that as we go through this 31 days of prayer, that we can learn how to say the right thing, speak the right words, amen, pray the right thing so that we can be in a position to receive answers to our prayer. Look at what, look, look what he says here in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, Paul is writing. The text says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers, what? Everywhere. Verse number 19, for good measure. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. Paul asks for prayer from the saints at Ephesus, and, he's, and, and he tells them to pray. So that's cr cr critically important for us to have the prayer life, okay? Go with me to 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. All I'm doing is giving you passages that says we have a commission a command to pray consistently. Look at what 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 says, what? Never stop what? Praying. Never stop praying. A person can experience the peace of God only as he walks and moves about in prayer. Why? Because peace is a supernatural thing. It comes from the power of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives, guys. And if we're trying to get peace from a person, you will always dis be disappointed. How many of y'all have had a person in your life before who you thought, amen, it was a joy to be around? That you, you love spending time with that person? Come on, raise your hand. But how many right now can honestly say that, that that person who you thought was a joy to be around is no longer in your life? And now when you see them coming, there is no peace. Anybody in the house? And again, uh, and I, I, I'm going to say this, and I'm saying it not to, not to offend anybody, but maybe, maybe you married somebody who you, you end up divorcing because there was no peace in the house, right? At the time that you married that person, you thought, this is the best thing since sliced light bread, right? At the time that you married that person, you thought, hey, amen, I'm going to live forever with this person. But people can't bring you peace. Only God can. There ought to be peace in your marriage, but if God is not in your marriage, there will not be any peace in your marriage. A three-stranded cord is not easily broken. Can I get a witness? And so never stop praying because prayer will bring peace. There is a supernatural peace that comes from God that surpasses all understanding that will keep your hearts in mind when you learn how to pray the right way. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to walk through and look at the words that we should be saying. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk, talk about what it means to really pray. We're going to go through some steps that you can take to get your prayers answered. 
Man, because I think this is critically important. This is not a deep message today. This is more of an encouragement message. God does answer prayer. Everybody say, God does answer prayer. Everybody say, God does answer prayer. And if my prayers are not being answered, I got to look at what, what is it that I'm doing? What is it that I'm praying? Is it in line with his will? Is, it, is, is, is this what I'm praying? Amen. In line with God's purpose of my life. And so we're going to learn how to do that, and we're going to talk through it so that as we do pray these next 31 days, each one of us will be on point and have God's will at the forefront of our mind. Amen? Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. God bless you. What happens when we pray?